right, how's everybody doing? Good, awesome. Well, thanks for having me here today. Like you said, my name's John Creasel. I lived uh, just south of St. Paul, Minnesota with my wife, Kayla, and our now three-year-old little girl, Chloe. So I joined the Minnesota National Guard on my 17th birthday because that was my dream, that was my goal, that's what I wanted to do since I was a little boy. When I saw the first Gulf War on TV, I was around 10 years old, and that was the first televised war in my lifetime. So I remember watching on TV, seeing the men and women over there protecting our way of life and the way of life of people across the world. I looked up to them. I said, if I can do that as a career, then count me in. So I held on to that dream and I joined the minute I could. Like I said, that was my 17th birthday. Now that was the best decision I ever made because I was quite the knucklehead when I was growing up. I had to do a lot of my schoolwork in the hallway because the teachers didn't think I was as funny as I thought I was. <laughs> so they'd send me out in the hallway, wouldn't disrupt the class, all was good. So I went to basic training the summer after my junior year in high school, came back from my senior year much better behaved. Uh, those drill sergeants are pretty good at getting the smart aleckness out of you, right? And shout out to my recruiters who lied through their teeth. <laughs> Made it sound like I was going to some fun summer camp. The drill sergeants didn't think I was funny either. I got slapped, I got kicked. Uh, so obviously that, that woke me up. I went back to my senior year after graduating basic training when the teachers had call on me. I'm like, please don't hit me, all right? So I went through my senior year, graduated. Then that last awesome summer before everyone goes to college or starts working, that last summer before adulthood kicks in, I got to go back down to Fort Benning to complete my job training. So I came back at the end of the summer of 2000 as a fully trained member of the Minnesota National Guard as an infantryman. Now at that time, the world situation was much different than it is today. So our primary mission was our one weekend a month of training, two weeks during the summer. If there was any floods or anything like that, we'd be activated to respond to those. As we all know, once 9-11 happened, everything changed. Then it wasn't a matter of if we'd get deployed anymore, it became a matter of when. And we got that call in the summer of 2003, although it wasn't the call we're expecting. I mean, with the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan going on, we thought it was a foregone conclusion that that's where we're headed. So we then learned that we're to be part of a NATO peacekeeping force in Kosovo. I'd heard about Kosovo a few years before when that was the top story in the news. Now, a good thing about the Guard, they don't just send us over there and have us figure it out. We go through a train up, so we did five months of training in Georgia, one month in Germany, and then we touched down at Camp Monteith, Kosovo in February of 2004. Now for me at the age of 22, that was a tremendous eye opener. That was the first time I'd been to a third world country, especially a war-torn third world country, and the first time I truly realized how fortunate we are to live in the United States of America. I mean, we're not perfect, but it's a pretty awesome place to be. So I was thankful to learn that lesson, right? So at the age of 22, that was a great wake-up call for me, and it really set the tone for the rest of my life, I think. No, our mission over there was pretty straightforward and simple. We're there to protect a group of people that couldn't protect our, themselves, keep the peace between two groups of people that have hated each other so long, they can't even explain why they hate each other. It's just the way it's always been, all right? Kind of like Democrats and Republicans, all right? So our, we would go on four to five hour patrols, meet with town leaders, mayors, make sure everybody was getting along, make sure they had everything they needed infrastructure wise, make sure no issues were about to bubble to the surface. And then we would go back to Camp Monteith, drop our vehicle off. And Camp Monteith was good. Like really, we were fortunate over there in the sense that never really were we in fear of our lives over there. Our biggest concern was trying to beat the unit from Iowa in floor hockey and softball, all right? We had nice living quarters. We had high-speed internet, which in 04 was a really big deal. Um, we had a nice gym, nice dining facility. We even had a movie theater. In fact, I'm pretty sure that's the first place I saw the movie Mean Girls. All right, so, and now I just admitted I've seen it more than once, so let's just keep that between us. Um, so we kind of had it made over there. So we'd get back from our patrol, drop our vehicle off, go to the chow hall. We'd sit down with our buddies from the other t platoons, talk about how was your day, how's your family back home, how's your internet girlfriend kind of thing. And then uh, on the TVs all the way around the dining facility, there are these big screen TVs. It would rotate through the cable news networks from back here in the United States. And the top story every single day was Iraq and Afghanistan. And we would see images of our brothers and sisters in harm's way, some of them coming home either wounded or killed. And it made us feel guilty. As an infantry unit, it's our job to fight in the war. All right, we had been retrained to be peacekeepers, and that was, like I said, an important mission. But we felt guilty. And I don't want to make it sound like we're minimizing the mission in Kosovo because we're not. We need, they needed us there, and it was important. And I certainly don't want to make it sound like we want there to be war, or we cheer for there to be war. We're the last ones that want there to be war, 
because we're the ones that have to fight in it. But if there is a war going on, we feel like that's where we should be because that's what we train to do. That's our Super Bowl. All right, not that I would know anything about Super Bowl being a Minnesota Vikings fan, of course. Um, so, and I rip them a lot, but I love them. I'm a diehard Vikings fan. I have a Vikings tattoo on my arm, and there are days I wish my arm was blown off too. But um, so, <laughs> so anyway, I digress. So we talked about this every day, how we were given kind of the easy mission and how we felt guilty. Now fast forward to the end of that deployment, everybody returned home safe and sound. My contract was expiring and I decided I was gonna get out. I wanted to be a paramedic firefighter for the St. Paul Fire Department, so to serve in a different capacity. Um, about three days before my contract expired, I got a call from one of my buddies that I was in Kosovo with. He had been promoted, moved up to brigade headquarters, kind of became a big deal. And if you asked him, he'd be glad to tell you that he became a big deal. He said, you're not actually getting out, are you? I said, oh yeah, it's been real and it's been fun, but it hasn't been real fun. He said, well, there's a deployment to Iraq coming up next year. I know your thoughts on it. Talk to your family and get back to me. I said, all right. I gathered up my family. I said, what do you think? They said, well, we can't tell you that you should go because if something happens to you, we'll feel responsible. And we can't tell you you shouldn't go because you'll resent us for it. They said, so let us ask you this. If you don't go on this deployment, when you turn 30 years old and look back on it, Will you regret it? I said, absolutely. They said, there is your decision, and we support that. Now, that's the most important thing we can have. It doesn't matter what we're doing in life, necessarily. Having that support at home is so very important, because without that support, we're not able to truly devote ourselves to our trade, and it prevents us from being great at it. So I appreciated having that support, and I decided I would go. So I had to re-enlist in the National Guard, and then those of us who had been on the Kosovo deployment, we hadn't been home long enough for the military to force us to go. So there's like a mandatory cool down period, and it makes sense, it'd be inhumane to say, welcome home from Kosovo, keep your bags packed, we're sending you somewhere else. But if you wanna go, you can volunteer. And now military buddies are the closest friends you could ever ask for, they become your family. And there's no way I was gonna sit back at Fort Living Room while my friends chose to go and vice versa. So we looked at each other and said, I will go if you go, I will go if you go, and I will go if you go. And a bunch of us went down to that St. Paul Armory together, uh, including my buddy Joe, who didn't have the same support at home that many of us did. His wife gave him an ultimatum and said, if you volunteer for this deployment, I'm divorcing you. And that man sprinted so fast to that armory to sign that waiver. <laughs> Might have beat you in your track and field days, John. I've never seen anybody more excited to go to Iraq than Joe, okay? <laughs> so. Um, so anyway, we signed the waiver. It was called a co-TTAD waiver. I still haven't looked up what it, what it uh, stands for, but it clearly says, I, the undersigned, volunteer to fight in the support of the global war on terror for a period not to exceed 396 days. Ended up being a little bit longer for our unit because we got extended as part of the surge, but I kept a copy of that on my fridge because if something happened to me, I, didn't want, I wanted my friends and family to remember that I wasn't a victim, I wasn't kidnapped and forced to go. I volunteered because I believed in it, I still do, and I would go back in a heartbeat if I could. Thank you. So I spent the summer of 2005 getting my ducks in a row, going through EMT training, tried out for the St. Paul Fire Department to get my name on the list. <clears throat> and then October 1 of 2005, we touched down at Camp Shelby, Mississippi to start our train up for Iraq. So we did five months of training there, one month at Fort Polk, Louisiana, and then they sent us to Kuwait for two weeks to heat up our Minnesota blood, get our weapons sighted in the last time, get our final issue of ammunition, and then we touched down at Camp Fallujah, Iraq on April 8, 2006. Now Camp Fallujah, Iraq is a Marine Corps base. We're an Army National Guard unit. So this is before there had been large-scale National Guard or Reserve deployments, so a lot of the active duty components hadn't had a chance to work with us, so they didn't have high opinions, right? We're part-timers part-timers, weekend warriors, other things I can't say in this room. Um, on top of that, there's a bit of a rivalry between the branches. Army dislikes Navy, Navy dislikes Army. Marines hate everybody. <laughs> That's why we love them, right? Yeah. So I knew this was gonna be an interesting deployment from the word go, so we get there and we're unpacking our bags to move into our temporary tents, our temporary housing, while we got trained in by the unit we're replacing. We follow them around for two weeks, watch what they say, what they do, everything they, just everything, because they're the experts. They've been doing it in country for quite a while. After two weeks, we lead the missions, they follow us around, make sure we're doing it right. 
and we're leading the missions, then after that two weeks, they head back to the US, we move into their permanent housing, that's how the rotation works. So we're unpacking our bags that first night, and it's pitch dark outside, they don't have any lights outside of the tents because it gives the insurgents a target, and we're unpacking our bags, and one of our buddies, I think he had been having a cigarette outside or something, he comes in, he goes, oh my God, you guys, did you see what happened to the tent outside? It's like, no. So we go out there, a bunch of us, because of course, oh, what? So we go out there and there's a tent completely destroyed. A couple nights before we arrived, an incoming enemy mortar round landed on it, destroyed it. The only thing standing was in the middle of it. There was an air conditioning unit that was, looked like it had been hit with 20 shotgun blasts from all the shrapnel. So we looked at each other and thought, of all these empty tents, the Marines put us next to that one. So they either want to scare the hell out of us or get us killed, I'm not sure. So we give them a hard time, but obviously it was an honor to serve alongside the Marines. Uh, you become family with them. So that first month or so in Iraq was extremely boring. At the age of 40, I would never complain about that again, all right? Boredom in a combat zone usually means you're safe. So they had us in these towers watching out to make sure nobody attacked Camp Fallujah We'd, for 12-hour shifts. And now the nature of the war over there, especially at that time, they launched mortars and rockets from a distance and put IEDs in the road. They weren't gonna gather up a huge army and storm the gates like it was Lord of the Rings, Middle Earth, you know, because they wouldn't have had a chance at success. So still people needed to be in the towers, I just didn't want it to be us. So for 12 hour shifts, we had enough time after that 12 hour shift to work out, shower, eat, then sleep, then back in the tower. And work out, shower, eat, then sleep than back in the tower. So after a few days of this, we looked at each other and thought, why did we sign that waiver and volunteer for this deployment again? But like anything in the military that seems like it makes no sense, there's always a method to the madness. You gotta crawl before you walk, walk before you run. So they had us do patrols just outside of Camp Fallujah, then further out into some villages, then further out, and then further out until we controlled a massive battle space all the way down to the Euphrates River an area so large that they had to add 50 Marines to our unit so we had the manpower to cover it. So we became a blended unit. On top of that, this is where nobody had been to check on them in a long time. The unit we replaced briefly went down there, suffered casualties and said, we're good, we're not going down there anymore. So this is where the enemy activity was at its greatest because they were able to do whatever they want whenever they wanted. So it became our job to stop that. And it became our job to push the insurgents further than a seven to eight mile radius away from Camp Fallujah so they couldn't reach the 19,000 service members living on base with mortars and rockets. Because there'd be days we're walking to the chow hall, to the PX, or to the gym, and there'd be mortars landing in populated areas, injuring or killing people just going about their day. So we pushed them, they pushed us, we pushed them, they pushed us. Throughout the summer of 2006 into the fall, our danger increased exponentially. And by the fall of 2006, almost every evening you could set your watch to it. Around 5 p.m., one of the patrols from our company would hit an improvised explosive device. And now, one of our other main missions at that time, we had to guard these two pump houses, Pump House Barney and Pump House Flanders. So whoever named them before we got there, like the, the Simpsons, obviously. Um, so these were critical to the area because they would pull water from the Euphrates River through a series of irrigation canals, which allowed the locals to grow crops. So before I went there, I pictured it to be big open desert. This was anything but that. It looked like central Iowa but with palm trees. There was farms, as far as the eye could see, it was very pretty. Now once the water got to the pump houses, it would be pumped to Camp Fallujah to supply the base with water. The insurgents knew if they cut off our water supply in the middle of the desert to a major military base, we'd be in trouble. So they'd attack these pump houses all the time. So we had to keep 10 to 20 men out there at all times to fight off any of these attacks, to watch for suspicious activity. And our squad spent the good majority of the month of September 2006 at Pump House Flanders. Um, Almost every evening, like I said, whoever had that evening shift, they'd be on the roof around 5 p.m. There'd be a large explosion in the distance. We'd see a mushroom cloud from one of the gravel roads. And our heart would sink because we knew what had happened, that one of the patrols from our company had just hit an IED. We would call our headquarters, let them know the general area so they could send help. And then we would listen to hear, is everybody all right? Is everybody okay? And now 30 seconds of silence in that situation feels like 30 years. Finally, someone would get on the radio and say, we're fine, minor injuries, ears are ringing, please call AAA because we need a tow truck kind of thing. And then we could breathe. Now, at that point in the deployment, we're one of only three squads that have been lucky enough to not hit an improvised explosive device. Like anything in life, when you're operating on luck, eventually that luck runs out. So when people ask me about my time in the military, 
I sum it up as nearly 10 years of really good times and one really bad day. That really bad day was December 2nd of 2006. We're on a foot patrol in the morning from Pump House Flanders to go watch an intersection that was critical to our mission. This was an intersection that was the only way really to get to the southern part of our sector where that enemy activity was. So it was a choke point and they knew that. So they'd put IEDs in the road all the time, hoping to kill as many of us as possible, if not kill, then injure or maim, or at the worst for them, but still a victory would be if we noticed that the dirt had been messed with, we'd back up 100 to 125 meters, we'd call the explosive ordnance disposal team, they usually would take four to five hours to get to us because we definitely weren't the only ones calling in bombs that day. They would show up, use robotics, detonate it, and then we're safe and we could move on, but now our element of surprise is gone. Now they know we're coming to check on them. So still a strategic victory for them, even though none of us were harmed. So we needed to find out who was doing this and, uh, and get them. So we went out in the middle of the night, we hid in this ditch, waiting for this person or these people to show up. We waited, and we waited some more, and we waited some more. They never showed up. Once the sun came up, we we're pretty sure that they were not gonna pay us a visit, but we had to stay in our spot until we got spotted by a goat farmer. And just in the, in the chance that they're cooperating with the insurgents, not because they didn't like us, but because if they didn't cooperate, they would be tortured and then killed. So none of us would blame them because it wasn't their fault they're in that spot. They're caught in the jaws of this war. But we couldn't take the risk. So once we got spotted, we went back to Pump House Flanders. We ate chow watch some uh, cartoons. He-Man, of course, gets you fired up for patrol. Power of Grey Skull, the whole bit. Um, and then we took a nap. So as far as Iraq goes, this was shaping up to be a pretty awesome day. Our lieutenant was up on the roof watching for suspicious activity and he spotted some. So he came and he woke us up. He said he needed five volunteers to go and check out the activity. So five of us said, we will go. Five of us in this fully up armored, brand new Humvee. Four of us in the seats, one guy sticking out of the top He's our, our machine gunner. Ahead of us is a Bradley fighting vehicle, which is a 32-ton armored personnel carrier. Picture a small tank, okay? But still way more heavily armed than a, uh, a Humvee. So that's always the lead vehicle, because that can take more of a beating. So we're the second vehicle, they're the lead vehicle, same configuration where I was sitting in the right front passenger seat operating the radio, because I was vehicle commander, calling in radio checkpoints to let our headquarters know our location in case we lost contact with them, they would know where to send the help. So we get down there, we search everybody and everything. It looked incredibly suspicious. Ended up being nothing. So again, shaping up to be a solid day in Iraq. Now, anytime you dismount the vehicle for any reason, you always leave the gunner in there to watch your back with that machine gun, but also to maintain radio contact with her headquarters and relay information back and forth. So as I was walking back to the vehicle, my gunner informed me that one of the unmanned drones our headquarters had called and said that one of the drones flying above us spotted somebody digging in the road at checkpoint 34. Now that was about two miles from our location and we knew that they weren't planting flowers, so we had to go and check it out. And now this wasn't the drones like you see on TV now, the big fancy ones. If Radio Shack was still a thing, you could probably buy these at Radio Shack, right? 20, 2006 was a long time ago. It feels like it wasn't, but yeah. So anyway, but it serves its purpose and they spotted that person digging in the road, so we had to go and get them. So, so same thing, Bradley fighting vehicle to the front, we're the second vehicle on our way to checkpoint 34. I vividly remember calling in checkpoint 31, checkpoint 32, and as I called in checkpoint 33, we rounded a corner, 90 degree turn to the south for the last stretch of road before getting to where that individual had been digging. As we rounded that corner, I remember hearing this metallic clink, this loud whooshing sound. I don't remember flying through the air and I don't remember hitting the ground. But I remember waking up on the ground. I hadn't yet opened my eyes, but I heard rocks falling, rocks hitting the ground, rocks hitting metal. It sounded very much like a hailstorm. I heard my buddy yelling, what's going on? What happened? Where's Brian? I didn't want to believe what had just happened, but like I said before, I've been a Minnesota Vikings fan my whole life, so I'm always prepared for the worst case scenario, all right? Who would have thought I'd end up probably potentially being one of the most accurate kickers in Vikings playoff history? Anyway. Um, so I opened my eyes, I see what had been this fully up armored Humvee, it was on its side, it was facing the wrong direction, completely demolished. Parts of the vehicle are laying everywhere, it looked nothing like a Humvee. The doors, which each door takes four strong soldiers to lift, those have been blown 100 yards in every direction. What had happened is when we rounded that corner, our left front tire drove over a pressure plate that set off 200 pounds of homemade explosives directly underneath our vehicle. They cut off the bottoms of two propane tanks, packed explosives in there, set that, buried that in the road, 
And what they do is they take little strips of garden hose and they line the whole inside with wire and then run wire through it. So if you step on it or drive over it, it completes the circuit. So that's what happened to us. Now I felt myself in a twisted, contorted position. So I knew I'd been injured, but I didn't know how badly because I didn't really feel any pain. So I looked down and I saw that my ulna and my radius and my left arm were broken. So that was kind of flopped. And I remember I think out loud going, I really hope there's not any nerve damage. So I applied traction to, and, and hold it to my chest. The things I learned in EMT training that I never thought I was gonna have to use on myself, you know? And uh, then I looked down. I saw that my left leg above the knee was, was, femur was doing one of these, was connected maybe by a piece of skin, but probably my pant leg is what was holding it together. My right leg just below the knee looked like I stuck it in a wood chipper and was bleeding profusely. I was pretty certain that this, this is where my life was gonna end. So I tried to stay calm human body, again, has an amazing way of doing that for us. And of course, we didn't have any medics with us with, because with the likelihood we're going to encounter the insurgents, we want to have as many riflemen with us as possible. And that's Murphy's Law. If you leave the medic back at base, someone's going to get hurt. You know, if you cancel your auto insurance, you get in a car accident pulling out of the driveway. That's just the way the world works, right? Thankfully, we all go through combat lifesaver training, and I'm very thankful my friends paid attention in that class. So they were about 100 to 125 meters ahead of us when we hit the bomb and the blast was so powerful they thought they hit it. So the two guys in the turret radioed down to the driver who's in a separate compartment and said, do we just hit an IED? He said, I think he did one of these like, no, I think we're good. They turned the turret around, saw our vehicle destroyed, flipped over on its side and people ejected. They knew the injuries were very serious. So they immediately called for a medevac helicopter and came rushing back to our location. So the two guys in the turret came out to provide first aid and that driver went up into the turret to maintain radio contact with our headquarters and the medevac helicopter. But just as important was him operating that main 25 millimeter gun watching our back because we were sitting ducks and I'm convinced to this day if it hadn't been for that Bradley fighting vehicle, we would have been ambushed. One of the main tactics of the insurgents at that time is they would set an IED up to create casualties as bait and then they would ambush the medics and the help when they arrived. So I'm very thankful for that, Bradley, and it saved our lives in more ways than one that day. So the first guy that comes up to me, my buddy Adam Gallant from Plummer, Minnesota, which is almost in Canada, far, far northwest Minnesota. Adam's best and worst quality, depending on who you ask, is that he wasn't born with the ability to sugarcoat anything. All right, and I appreciate it. Like if we're dressed up to go out on the town, not in Iraq, obviously, but it'd be like, how, does, how do I look? He'd be like, you look horrendous, you need to change. I like that, shoot it straight. I never have to wonder where I stand with Adam. So Adam comes up to me, he looks at me, he goes, Crease, we're not gonna lie to you, dude. I'm not gonna lie to you, dude. Your legs are really bad right now, okay? And I was like, okay, I was staring at my bones. So I was like, I got that, Adam. My eyes are fine, I can see that my legs are not. But he said, we're gonna get you out of here, you're gonna be just fine. I said, okay. So he put a tourniquet on my right leg, tightened that, got the bleeding to stop, and that, um, that leg was bleeding a ton. He said, I'll be right back, you need to check on the other. I said, okay. I'll be right here, I'm not going anywhere. So he starts working on someone to my left. Next guy that comes up to me, my buddy Todd Everson, he now lives in the Twin Cities. He was from a town called Greenbush, and it's very on brand for him. Um, He comes over to me, and Todd's the complete opposite of Adam. He looks at me and he goes, hey buddy, you look great. (laughs) Everything's awesome. You're gonna be home soon. You're gonna see your family. You look amazing. It was the fakest smile I'd seen until I got into politics, all right? (laughs) Just kidding, all those smiles are real. (laughs) So he starts working on this left leg, tightening the tourniquet, it would slide off, he'd undo it, slide it back up, tighten it, it would slide off, he'd give the... Finally got it to stay, covered me up with gauze, he's like, okay, buddy, I'll be right back. Okay, fine. So he's over helping with what's going on to my left. And there had been five of us in the vehicle, so there are, these two guys are dealing with everybody. And based on the sounds I heard to my left, I knew that I was not the most severely injured. I could hear one of my friends fighting for their life. And I had to make a decision at that point that, okay, if I do survive, do I want the image of one of my best friends, dead or dying, burned into my mind? Absolutely not. On top of that, I've already lost a ton of blood. I can't afford to lose any more. And seeing that, I I need to stay calm. And seeing one of my friends in that condition would not keep me calm. So I decided, okay, I'm gonna just take it easy. I'm gonna close my eyes and just rest. Terrible idea, by the way. 
So they're running around doing the triage and seeing, and then they see me taking a cat nap. It was like those times where you're just going to close your eyes to rest them and you're dreaming that fast. It was like that. So I'd just be fully asleep. And they'd see that and they're like, hey, bam, stay awake, keep fighting. All right, fine, fine. Dealing with the others, come by again. Hey, bam, stay awake, keep fighting. Then out I go again. The third one, I'm pretty sure was my most severe injury that day. I don't think they opened their hand. I think it was a straight up punch to the face. And I was like, ah, unbelievable. I remember that hurt really bad. And I'm like, how ridiculous is this? I survive a 200 pound bomb blast and my friends are trying to beat me to death. I was like, did they sneak their name on my life insurance policy? What the heck's going on here? So they're like, stay awake. I'm like, got it, got it. Well, then Adam comes over and like I said, cannot sugarcoat a thing. He comes over to me, he says, Crease, we're gonna have to move you. This is going to suck really bad. I was like, okay, I don't think it could get any worse. I was wrong. They flipped my legs up onto my chest. Yeah, yep, I had a similar reaction. And uh, I'd never been a hockey goalie, not a gymnast, not remotely flexible, so I knew I was in deep trouble. Well, then they go to lift me. One guy under the arms and the other one, only other spot to grab was my butt. Little did they, they didn't know, nor did I know, that my pelvis, both wings of it were broken, right? So my pelvis looked like the light fixture I got from Amazon a week and a half ago that looked just devastated. Um, so when they lifted me up, I felt all of that pain, let out a yell to let them know, all right, I feel that. They had to move me away from the vehicle because the vehicle was on its side and it was on top of my buddy that they were trying to rescue. And so if that tipped over, it would kill us both. So they moved me to a safe spot and then realizing they had to keep me awake and alert, but they probably shouldn't keep throwing haymakers at me. They came up with a brilliant idea. Now the person you would have thought would have been the most severely injured would have been the guy sticking out of the top of the vehicle when we hit this 200 pound bomb. But all 140 pounds of Marine Lance Corporal Miller got shot out of that vehicle like a Roman candle, like Super Dave out of the cannon. He's running around like a chicken with his head cut off. What time is it, you guys? What time is it? I need to know what time it is. You guys, what time is it? His watch had been blown off. And he was repeating himself, so he obviously had a brain injury, although I'm pretty sure he started the deployment with one. <laughs> great guy, great Marine, loved being in charge of him, but he's just a little bit touched, okay? And he, we even joked that, we even joked, because he was from Idaho, that if we go visit him after the deployment, we pull one of those beautiful potatoes out of the ground, might have a higher IQ than old Bruce. So anyway, and he never denied it. He just goes, shut up, you guys, it's not funny. It was funny and still is. So anyway, they said, keep Creasel talking. Brilliant. So he sits down next to me. Sergeant Creasel, where do you live? Cottage Grove, Minnesota. What's your favorite team? Minnesota Vikings. He goes, let him die, he'll be better off. No. Um, What's your favorite color? Blue. Roger, Roger. Sergeant Creasel, where do you live? So like the third time through this, I'm like, get him away from me. He's like, negative Sergeant, I need to know where you live. So at this point, I felt myself starting to get cold. I knew a good Minnesota boy on an 80 degree December day in Iraq should not be feeling cold, so I was pretty sure things were wrapping up. So I said my prayers, obviously wanted to survive, but I was not optimistic I was gonna make it. And uh, I remember thinking, if this is truly going to be the end, let's hurry up, because this does suck. And as dumb as it sounds, I remember thinking, go out looking tough. Because who doesn't want to go out looking tough? No, I knew, I pictured in this whole 20-minute sequence, I remember picturing my family being notified that I died. And I knew at some point in the future, my friends would meet with them and kind of go over the whole thing, just for closure for everyone. That's just what we do. And I didn't want my family to hear at my last moments I was freaking out and yelling and kicking and scared. Well, kicking would have been kind of out of the question. <laughs> but you get, you get my drift. So I didn't want them to think I was suffering at my last moments. So Adam was running by and I grabbed him with my good arm and I looked at him and I said, tell my family I love them. And like a good friend, he looked at me and he said, shut up, you are going to tell them yourself. And it gave me hope. It is the first time that day I felt hope and I thought, I can do this, I can survive. I have to, this is the only chance I get. So I was kind of propped up. I was talking to myself like, okay, stay away, keep fighting. Miller's still asking me the same questions. And then in the distance, I heard a helicopter. And I thought this one has to be ours, has to be ours, please be ours. And I saw it got louder and louder, closer and closer. I saw Adam shoot a star cluster up into the sky to let them know it was us that needed the help. 
just in case the flipped over and devastated Humvee wasn't enough of an indicator, but you never know. And uh, with it was a Cobra attack helicopter that if there had been an ambush, they would have cleaned that up quickly. Now at the same time they were coming in, our backup came to secure the scene of the incident and all that good stuff, and they had a ground ambulance with them. Out of that ground ambulance jumped out one of our young medics who clearly had not seen anything like this before because he comes running over, hey, Sergeant Creasel, whoa! Not exactly inspiring, right? Like, we go through combat lifesaver training, which is far below what the medics are taught, and there they teach us reassure the casualty. Just lie to me, right? Like Todd was doing, Todd's like, hey, that shrapnel fixed your face, you know? So the medic looks at me and goes, Sergeant Creasel, I'm gonna give you morphine. And my exact quote was, whatever, dude. I was on a backboard, he stuck it here, they load me in the helicopter, I heard a couple other people get loaded on that thing, took off faster than any bird I'd ever been on. And we got up in the air, I remember the flight nurse saying, John, I need to know your social security number. I thought, great, I'm gonna die, they wanna open up a credit card real quick. <laughs> it's before I had LifeLock. So, um, Use up that credit limit. I wasn't going to, so. So I was so exhausted, I couldn't get the first number of it out. And that's the last thing I remember till I woke up eight days later at Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Washington, D.C. So I've been to two field hospitals in Iraq. The first one, they had to shock me back to life three times. Um, stabilized me for a flight to Balad Air Base, north of Baghdad there. They stabilized me for a flight to Landstuhl, Germany. And in Landstuhl, my situation deteriorated enough that my family was flown over basically to say goodbye but I tricked them, I'm still here. So they told my family, nobody misses four flights and survives, and I'd missed three. So thankfully I made that fourth flight and woke up, like I said, eight days later at Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Washington, DC. I woke up to an unfamiliar woman's voice saying, John, John, do you know where you're at? So it's just like college. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, thank you. Uh, so I opened my eyes, I saw it was a hospital room, so I thought, this better not be heaven, otherwise I've been misled. <laughs> Might be the other place and my school teachers were right. So I said, Germany? She said, no, you were just in Germany, you're now at Walter Reed, welcome home. So I was like, all right. Then she goes, do you know who this is? And standing next to her was my ex-wife, my wife at that time. And she goes, what, what's her name? And I thought, that's a stupid question. But then I couldn't remember her name. Yeah, and that's when I wanted to remember her name. And now the look on her face was not great. It was like, he's even worse than the night we first met. So um, thankfully, I didn't just start guessing. That would have made things real awkward, right? Brittany, Susan, Rachel. <laughs> would have had to spend some time sleeping on the couch. But as many of you know, there are benefits to this situation, right? I like to look at the bright side. The parking situation, solid. Getting to pre-board at the airport, solid. And if you do upset the wife and have to sleep on the couch, you can fit on the love seat and there's tons of room. No big deal. 